Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out. We have a really exciting presentation for you tonight, talking about vegetables, perennials, roses, herbs. I think everybody's going to learn an awful lot. So we're just really excited and, and very thankful for all of our presenters. We have several tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. Mandy Reynolds is our county extension officer, agent. Educator. Educator. Coordinator. <laughs> It's like herding cats. No, just kidding. Okay. I am going to try to not bounce around so much. So this, this microphone is just for looks. It doesn't amplify my voice at all. It just actually connects us to our video camera. So we are recording this. Um, we do have a YouTube channel. So you should go on YouTube and follow us. Um, did everybody get one of these? I tried to hit everybody with one of these. It's the garden planner. If you don't have one and you want one. So Mary, there's a couple ladies here in the middle that don't have one. Okay. <clears throat> so if you'll take them out, then we can kind of go through it together. Um, this is a super handy, cool tool. Can you guys all hear me? A little louder. A little louder. Use my mom voice. Okay, so if you guys would all get out your garden planners, I apologize to the folks in the front because I am yelling, but the garden planners have two sides. One says fall in the left-hand corner and one says spring. We're going to look at the spring side. For the, for the most part, you're probably going to use the spring side. So you'll see that it does slide. So I'm going to have you go all the way over to the left and you'll see your vegetables. Um, cabbage, cucumbers, okra, pumpkins, all of those over here on the left-hand side. And then if you, if you go all the way to the right, you'll see in light blue writing over here, those are the companion plants for those that are on to your left. So if you, if you want to know what grows with beets, then you know that you can slide it over there and you can look and see what's going to be friendly with beets. We want, our, we want our plants to be friends and get along. So always try to plant those over here. Otherwise, your plants are probably not going to do as well. Um, also, um, the slider part of it is really cool because what you do is you take that red line that's down there in the middle of it, and it says average last spring frost. If you slide that over to our average last spring frost, which some of you guys are probably going to boo me. Um, I'm going to go with the line in between May 24th and May 31st. I realize that's, that's pushing it. If you're my mother-in-law, you're over there at the June 7th line. But, um, so, but if we push our line there, so if you go back over to the left just a little bit of that red line, you'll see SI and you'll see FP in a few places. SI is those dates that you should start planting those vegetables inside, start inside. And the FP is first planting outside. So you can see like your onions, April 12th, okay? Who's planted their onions? Hey, look at that. Whose onions are in their garage? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then also, another super cool little thing, those green check marks, that's when you can expect your harvest. Okay, so you should be able to kind of plan out your garden this way. It's a super great tool. I promise you, you are going to use this thing a lot. Um, you're going to tell your husbands or your wives to not touch this because it's going to be your favorite thing. Um, also, it'll tell you, you know, how far apart um, to plant your rows over in the red on the left-hand side when you slide it all the way out. It'll also tell you um, how deep to plant your plants. So if you forget all, all of this stuff, this little paper in here with it is instructions. And then it also has the same thing on the reverse, so if you want to look at your fall side of things, you just flip it over and you're going to do the same thing on the average first fall frost. And as we know, we're probably going to put that right between the 13th and the 20th 
in September. Okay? So yeah, so you're if you're gonna if you're gonna want um, to do tomatoes in September, you're gonna want to start those inside May 3rd. So that's use the spring side, it works the best. Anyways, if you have friends or family that want one of these, we do have them at the extension office. Um, they are a handy tool. And is that it? Who's up next? It is Rich and Jody. We have a great lineup tonight. I really don't know how we're going to squeeze it all in, but you guys are in for a treat. So thank you. Yes, microphone. And I probably stopped talking loud, didn't I? Yeah, I can hear you though. Okay. Oh, dark inside. All right. How is everybody tonight? Good. So make sure you like our Facebook page. It's under Kemah County Master Gardeners. So a lot of our activities, if something changes or something, we do post stuff on there. So make sure you like that page, follow it, share. If you get something, a trees, take pictures of your trees that you get from the Master Gardeners things. We might want to talk about that tree sale too. Yes. I'll let you do that first. Okay, I'll just come up next to you. Um, May 4th is our tree sale, Master Gardener tree sale. Um, we do, we are still taking pre-orders. Um, we have, on Tuesday we had roughly 800 trees left. So if you want trees, bare root trees, the prices are great. Stop by our office, um, sooner the better. Um, because we are going to have to cut that off um, next week so that we can start filling orders. But um, on May 4th, from 7.30 in the morning till 5.30 in the afternoon, we will have our tree sale, and those are the trees that have not pre-sold. So we do still have plenty available, but um, first come, first serve. So if you so want to get May 4th, oh, May it's 4th. a Thursday, yep. And it's at the Campbell County Ice Arena, which is down on... Um, Second Street, yes. Is it the old fairgrounds? Yep, the old fairgrounds. Yep, oh. yep. Next to the soup kitchen, um, yep. the building next to uh, it. Which is now the ice arena, so yeah. sometimes there's auctions and stuff like that in there, but yep, that's where we're going to be. So. And we have lots of neat trees, so mm -hmm. come make and sure you come. And raspberries. And strawberries. Oh, really? Strawberries too? The extension office is at 412 South Gillette Avenue, which is the old George Amos Memorial Building. Downstairs, you just go on the side entry. Go around to the right hand side. All right. Anybody have questions on the tree sale? That's one of our fundraisers that we do, and it's where we get a lot of our money to be able to do a lot of this stuff. So make sure you come and buy trees and tell everybody, share it on Facebook and everything too. So help us out. Um, everybody knows zones, so I'm just going to talk about planting tomatoes. So you, when you start, you know when you start your tomatoes and when to plant them outside, so you want to start them at a certain amount of time. Um, when I first started, I used to do the little jiffy things back in the olden days and had them all over, and it takes up a lot of space. Then I went to these things, those still take up a lot of space. So now what I do is I just plant my seeds except for like um, cucumbers, stuff like that. On the viney stuff, I just um, start them in this size of pot because I'm ready to sell those at a certain amount of time. If I'm gonna do tomatoes, any of the other stuff, I plant them in a flat like this and make sure you label them. And then when they first, get, they get their first leaves when they pop out, when they get their second leaves is when I'm gonna transplant these. So these are a little bit, I planted them a little too early and it's nice weather and stuff and nice sun. So I was gonna show you guys how to transplant these when you get them. So on your package of seeds, it kind of has in there each plant. So like the heirloom ones take longer days to mature. So those ones you probably want to start way earlier because they take longer. So in the ones like the hybrids, a lot of those are short term, or not short term, shorter season. So you can plant those not as early as you can on the other ones. So look on your back of your seeds. They do tell you when kind of for, go by our date off that chart that Mandy went off of, when to start planting your seeds. And what I do is 
nowadays they don't have, like when you used to order the seeds, they had 50 seeds in a packet. Now it's like five, 10 seeds or whatever. So when you plant a whole, now it's, when I plant a whole, I do a whole bunch of a one variety because then I just put those up to sell into in the, the three and inch pots. So I do them this way. Then when they get their second leaves, then I just, these are more longer. I usually try to get a little bit more root than that. I didn't squeeze it. So then when I transplant these, I'm gonna break these, cut these little leaves off and plant it up to about to here because all this is gonna be coming to roots. The more roots you get into this, the more it's gonna produce moisture and to bring up into the tomatoes itself. So like on these big ones, I would plant it, I would pinch these all off to here. Probably I'd go up to my fingernails. I, trimmed, I chewed my fingernails, I didn't really trim them. I would plant this about to there or so. So all this comes, do this to tomato plants. Not You can't do it to like peppers and stuff like that. But the tomatoes, this way, all these little fuzzy things become roots. So those are gonna, then the more you get it, more roots on it, the more water it's gonna bring up to for the tomatoes and stuff. And then like the in, intermediate, how do you say, intermediate, or? Intermediate. Yeah, in, that, those ones, I do them as a vine. So I don't let them sucker out at all. And I grow them on a, a string that goes up. I wrap it around that string as it grows up. And any of those suckers on there, I pinch those off to get then the flowers and you leave the leaves on so then it will produce down here, and I'll pluck those tomatoes. It puts more strength. You'll be surprised how much more, if you water them and stuff, how much bigger and juicier the tomatoes will be by just letting them all sucker out because all that moisture is going ever which way. So that when you pick these tomatoes on the, on the bottom, then you're gonna pick those leaves because they gotta have the leaves to shade the plants themselves, the tomatoes. Otherwise, I'll get sunburned and stuff. So you, and I just keep on moving it up and just any suckers, pinch them off so that way they become like a vine and stuff. Can you describe where those suckers are at? Um, they usually come in, well, this one's starting. So they'll, they'll usually, so like the, where this leaf is, there's a little sucker and you're just gonna pinch that little baby off of there so that it's not gonna grow any, um, other stems off of there. So this keeps on going up. Sometimes you'll get one that, and I don't know what the true name is, they actually become where they stop growing a, a stem up. And then sometimes I'll let a little sucker grow to kind of go up past that point. But if you, the more you, that's, my mom and dad when, they, when I was younger would had a, a, God what is that, a clothesline and they had this uh, wire going across and strings down on those, then that's how they did it on their tomatoes back in the, the olden days. I don't know if Dixie remembers back in those days. <laughs> um, stuff. So, but it's much easier to start out instead of having these every which way on your tomatoes and stuff, just do them this way. Then, because sometimes if this one won't grow, this one, this one won't sprout, this way you can get them growing then I would put them in this one here. This is about the right size for these ones. And then they'll kind of, they'll really, you'd be surprised once they get the roots, how fast they will go. And then plus fertilize them and stuff like that. Any questions on that? Was that, was that a, really a root that was hanging down there? Yes. Line? Well, it, see, and I put them in, a, in these here. They're actually, it's almost like hydroponics because they grow the roots down inside there on that part there, but that is the root on that part and stuff. So they're, when you get them in the dirt, they're, I mean, they'll take off like crazy. So if, any other questions? Go for it. Do you think it would work with the tomatillo? Uh, well, I did the determinant ones. They're more of a bushy tomato. Um, the little ones, the, they're not gonna get as big because it's not gonna grow because it's bred to stay small. But the determinant ones, I actually did it on those two and I still got good tomatoes off of them. Bigger, nicer, fuller tomatoes than those ones. That's what these ones are, is the little micro ones. So these are actually three months old, these guys here. So they're not gonna get 
They're the little, I mean, they're little, little tomatoes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, into the, the first one, it grows, it will produce throughout the season. The determinant one is, is it like 60 days or 30 days? It, it produces at a certain amount of time. Did I say that right? And stuff. What's that? One crop. Yeah, one crop. And, it, and it, when I did them as a vine, they still produce like the in, intermediate ones to go up. They still produce at different times instead of just all at one time. Because I think it didn't have a whole bunch of them to do to get ready for. Any other questions? Nope. And then I'm going to introduce Jody. Jody. <laughs> um, and we'll try, if we can squeeze everything in, we'll kind of take general questions later. Oh. I really like what Rich is doing because Rich. I do so much damage oh. to plants when I try to start them. I do so much damage to Rich trying to get them out of those individual little things. Much less damage with that. Okay. Oh, I have to pack this around. Okay. So I need my props over here. Um, gonna, just going to quick, t in a very short amount of time, talk about just a few tips to get started early this spring. I mean, can, can Wyoming Springs be any more challenging than this one? I mean, that, that, that snow laid on the ground, the, the soil is so cold. It is just, you know, normally a lot of people would have been putting in their onions and their peas and, you know, gone ahead and put the lettuce and spinach and everything else in it but that soil is so cold right now your seed may just you know just die or anyway it'll be set so far back that it won't come up good so we're gonna go ahead and talk about a few things to get started early on just to get a little jump when we do end up having a year like this can you all hear me when I'm walking back and forth <laughs> so probably the best thing that we can do right now in uh, conditions that we're having is to the best thing we can do is to warm up that soil and you know even when you think of cool season crops your broccoli your spinach cabbage those still if the soil is only 35 degrees nothing's going to happen it says that you might get germination but really if you can get the soil up to at least 45 degrees to 50 degrees that germination is going to happen so much more quickly and the plant's going to be under a lot less stress when it's coming through so the easiest way to get that soil warmed up is clear plastic so whether you are growing in wide beds or if you're just doing you know your flat standard gardening like my parents did row gardening or maybe you have raised beds any kind of clear plastic whether it's the expensive kind that goes over the greenhouses or that thing that you just brought that new mattress home from you know that's two layers you know something cheap like that get that on the ground if you have left your garden mulched over the winter to protect the soil get that soil raked off maybe the snow right now too again get that raked off get that clear plastic not black clear plastic on the soil so the sun can shine directly through it and be hitting the soil get it anchored down a wind like today it's going to be in the neighbor's horse pasture so get it anchored down and first put your finger in that soil if you don't have a soil thermometer and see how cold it is and then once we do get just a few days of good sunshine stick your finger in that soil and enter to it deep again and see the difference and you can gauge with your finger you don't have to have a soil thermometer you can pretty much gauge with your finger and see how much difference that that soil temperature has come up already so as soon as you have used that clear plastic on the air cover your whole as much of your garden as you can right now if possible so you're also getting ready for your warm season crops but so if you already have a designated area where you're going to be putting in your cool season crops get that warmed up then as soon as that's warmed up a little bit and that might you know they're saying Don Day the weather guy is saying in about 10 days we should be through this really cold spell and maybe start coming closer to normal spring temperatures so you know we can shoot for that so anyway start rolling that plastic back and start planting those early seeds again your lettuces spinach um, if you do start broccoli in the ground you can go ahead and do it by seed at that time too um, Brussels sprouts and, and um, cabbage, if you start by seed, you can do that. But definitely your spinach and your lettuces, get those going. Now, 
Now, if you're going to do the transplants of those same cold hardy um, crops, um, because you can even get the lettuces um, and the spinach that are, you know, come in those transplants at any of the garden stores, just like Rich was showing in those little four packs and so on. I think you're going to want to wait for the soil to warm up a little bit more. So again, under that clear plastic, leave that until that soil is warmed up. Gosh, guys, let's, you know, if you can get it up to 45 or 50 degrees, it's sure going to make a difference. Um, you know, if we're sticking things straight out of a greenhouse situation or our own um, home where we've been growing them inside and pop them into that cold soil, that transplant shock is just going to stunt them and they they may never come out of it and really thrive so getting the soil warm but then we've got to go to the next step after getting the soil warm and that is to protect those plants from this wind this cold wind and we're still going to have swings in temperatures and those nights are still going to get really cold so um, a few things that you can do at home um, and again you you don't have to spend money on stuff. You can use stuff you have at home. It can be anything from um, interfacing or like shear, um, what do I want to say, Those, the, the drapes that are shears. What do you call them? Just shears, I guess. Shears. shears. Yeah, you can pick those up really cheap at secondhand stores, things like that, that can really make a difference if you can block some wind with that and give your plants a little more, more start on that. I, for years, I've used the, what they call the floating row cover. Um, this, I have had this for probably close to 20 years. This particular one is a heavier weight. It's Frost Guard and the brand was remade, but you guys can look for any kind of a floating row cover. I'll send these down and around for you. And you know, when you first start out, you can, you can double it up or just single, but usually it's just single. The light goes through this, but it'll really block the wind. And if you can, you know, again, I have them cut for the sizes of what, what my beds are. So whether you're doing row planting or wide rows, or if you've got, um, you know, raised beds that are four by four, that's what you're going to do. But you want to be able to create some kind of a tunnel or um, a covered wagon, um, you know, type uh, situation to put this fabric cover over to protect your actual transplants when you first start. What I've done is because I, we came across a bunch of this PVC pipe that's pretty flexible and it, there was a lot of damage in it, but um, I was able to get a lot of like six foot links cut out of it. And then what we did, again, scavenged some rebar that was bent up at a construction site, cut it into 10 inch links and pounded them on each side of my wide rows and then bent this and put you know, pounded them in the ground, left about four inches up. Put this over those. But you can do heavy duty wire and kind of make wickets. Um, whatever you can come across at home. I've seen barrels laid down, um, old lawn chairs. Whatever you can drape this row cover over and then get it anchored down against the wind. And then gradually um, as the, as the you know, weather settles, then we can start opening the, the tunnels or the little hoop up on the ends or rolling the sides up. You want to start introducing those plants to some breeze because the more those plants move you know, without being damaged, the more they build up the cuticle in that main stem which really makes them sturdy and strong. And if you're like Rich and you're starting your plants in your house, when you're starting them in your house, get one of those oscillating fans going on those plants because besides um, you know keeping you, you from having damping off disease and other diseases that can affect your plants that movement's going to give you some really sturdy great little plants so it makes a difference introduce start introducing them to that wind so they build up the cuticle you know we baby things too much just like our kids they can't stand up on their own so you know same deal gradually introduce those plants to a little bit more weather all the time okay um, Boy, I know I'm speaking really fast. We have so much to go through. Anybody have some questions so far? Where do you get those? Well, you know, um, I, I, I don't know. Can you still get row covers at some of the big box stores here? I know that you can get it online. This stuff, real honestly, this came from a nursery when some master gardeners went down. Remember this, Heather? It was a long time ago. You guys were in Fort Collins, and you picked it up at the nursery for me there. How many years ago was that? great big huge amount so 
a lot of years ago. So, you know, if you take care of it and don't let it fly off into the, you know, in the barbed wire fence. This is, but anyway, you just look for floating row cover or just row cover or, um, that's a, it, yeah, it, Remay is the brand of this particular one and that was one of the first ones that came out and that's why I, in general, just kind of call it all Remay, but, but that's what it is, so. Okay, another quick sidebar on what this stuff is great for, even though once your plants are already doing great and the weather is settled and we're, we're full on into summer starting, when your cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts um, are to the point at about that same time that the little, um, the, what, the, white, the little white butterfly, the cabbage, the cabbage butterfly, and then there's also another moth that the, um, that the, the, it's the inchworm, it's the looper that's a different moth. But when those moths start flying around looking for a place to lay eggs on your, you know, your coal crops, your cruciferous or your broccoli, cabbage type plants, this stuff covering them during that period can make all the difference with you fighting, um, you, know, have, you know, having to soak that broccoli head in salt water and watch the worms come out. You know, I know it's a little extra protein, but, you know, it can really <laughs> turn off people that, you know, would otherwise maybe love to start eating fresh vegetables out of a garden, but then that's their introduction and that might be it for them. So, anyway, that works great. It works great for that. So it's when you see those little white or creamy colored, you know, butterflies and moths flying, flitting around, that's what they're doing is looking for your coal crops in order to lay their eggs. Do you cover those with that in the daytime or just at night? Um, like when we're, when, when, when we're putting this out to protect the transplants, this goes on and it stays on until the weather settles. On those nice warm, and it won't overheat under this, no, and it still gets plenty of sun, but on those nice warm days, you can open it up from like the long side or open it up on the ends. But again, we've, you know, put rocks or boards or something along it to hold it down. But for the moths, um, it's just, you know, they don't come out until it's a little bit warmer. And as soon as you see the first ones flitting around in your garden, you can cover your things up. You don't have to cover up a whole row. You can just get, you know, again, the sheer curtains. If you can individually drape that over your cabbage and, and broccoli. In the daytime and the night? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, it won't hurt. It just seemed like it'd get it too hot because they don't. Well, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, leave a little air space around that. So. Right. Okay. Um, let's. Yes? Could you say how to attach that onto your thing? Okay. So, you know, if, if I've just got hoops and so on that, that it can come, you know, like, like the person that I saw that used tires, I mean, they had, it was probably a 16 wide row bed and they had. I think four tires, and then in between the, all setting on edge, set down in the soil. In between each tire, they had rope going um, across the tires so that there was a little more support. And then this was laid out, all the, you know, you just drape it over all the way across like that, and then kind of on the end where there's that doesn't, on the end where they're coming, where it's coming together, just tie it up there. But on those long edges, or if you're square or whatever, on those edges, um, usually what, what I did at my house, because I had a lot of old hose, is I went out along the side and I rolled it, rolled the extra remake on the hose, and then I just put rocks down every so often to hold it on both this side and that side, and then just kind of gathered up the ends and just set another rock down there. I didn't put anything over the top to hold it down. I just anchored it at the bases, and we get a lot of wind out there. But you can certainly, um, you know, take some strips of cloth or something like that too, and and come over right over the top of the hoops. But I didn't find it necessary. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions so far? Okay. So. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there was one other thing I want to talk about talk, when we're talking about the cool season crops. Like, again, your broccoli, your lettuces, spinach, and you've probably heard the term bolting, B-O-L-T-I-N-G, and that's when that plant, 
will send up that stock and flower and go to seed and then quit producing either your nice solid little um, heads of broccoli or quit producing those nice tender delicious leaves of spinach and lettuce and it starts to get bitter. Um, and usually we think of that as just the heat stress in the middle of the summer that causes that. But shocking those plants into too cold of soil when we transplant them um, or if there's huge swings in temperatures like there are some years going from I mean 80 degrees one week and 40 degrees the next those two swings and swings in soil moisture all of those can cause enough stress to those plants that that can also cause bolting early on in the year so it's just the plants natural reflex to stress what's the plant want to do it wants to to flower, go to seed, to propagate itself before it dies. So that's all it's doing. So that's what bolting is. So we need to we need to be concerned and protect the plants on both you know both ends from for that. You know once once the season gets too hot or the day length gets too long, you know your spinach spinach is going to be done anyway. But you know we can do things like planting some of those on the north side of tall crops or where they're going to get a little bit more shade and be a little cooler, and that can. Um, keep that keep that production time a little bit longer there also okay oh I was speaking fast I need to wonder what have I missed so far okay um, when we're yes my spinach is ready to eat wow good for you can we all come over <laughs> that is wonderful planted it in February, it in February. Go out there and plant it with my granddaughter it's yeah a little secret that we do mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Yeah, and my folks always um, seeded lettuce or let it just go to seed itself and the same with spinach or seeded it when the plants do it naturally, you know, in the late summer and fall and then they would always have um, a way earlier crop than when we would just individually plant those seeds in the garden. So the seed and the same thing and if you're doing that year after year you have a variety what you know usually it's like black seeded simpson which is really great about that with with the lettuce if you do that year after year it becomes more and more adapted to your specific microclimate and you're just guaranteed usually a really early natural crop that way so that that works good yeah really great yeah so, and especially if you have uh, like a, you know, gradually sloping hillside or not really heavy clay soil that's down in the bottom, you're going to get um, that sprouting and that growth a little bit quicker. Or if you have raised beds too, that helps a lot. So, good for you. I'm envious. <laughs> so, okay. One of the things I wanted to mention about, yes, many of you may have already or would have usually planted peas, um, but this year if you haven't, you want to get a little more of a jump on it you can pre-germinate your peas and this also works for a lot of your warm season seed that's bigger just by and I'm not talking about soaking it overnight because a lot of your seeds like beans and peas will soak up too much water too fast and they'll split open and then and it's not gonna it's not gonna germinate and produce after that or it'll be deformed so you want to just soak it even if it's only for 10 minutes just soak your pea seed just a little while then get some paper towel and put that pea seed between two layers of damp paper towel. So you've got your damp pea seed, your damp paper towels, both sides. Slip it into a bread bag or another plastic bag. Leave it on your kitchen counter where you see it all the time. So you're reminded, in two days, take a look. Um, you might not have sprouted yet, but take a look. See if it needs a little bit more moisture. It just needs to stay damp. But by three or four days, you may very well have already start seeing some growth come out of those peas. And if you'll go ahead, when about half of them have like an eighth to a quarter inch of growth, um, go ahead and get them planted then. And they're going to be popping out of the ground so much quicker. Be really gentle with it because those are so tender. They'll snap off. I mean, if you're trying to pack soil around them, they'll snap off pretty easy. And that's why you don't want them to let it wait till they get really long and start growing up out of the, through the um, paper towel. So, so anyway, it's definitely worth a try. Um, and a, you know, where they may not have germinated in the real cold soil, if you pre-germinate them and then put them in the soil, which is still a little too cold, they have a better chance of really taking off. So. Um, I don't, but you know, if you're in a garden that you've already grown peas um, or beans or, you know, cover crops that included other legumes, it 
probably isn't going to make much difference, but, but if you haven't, you can give it a try, do some experiments, see if it works for you. Pretty pricey way to go, and, um, but it, it might work if you have some, some soil that is quite sterile or, you know, kind of, you know, that you're not, not too um, in love with, it might not hurt to go ahead and, and put some money into the pre-inoculant for the legume type crops, your beans and your seeds. So. Um, there, I didn't pack, I did pack it back with me. Um, there's a really super book um, put out by the Extension Office and the um, and, and NRCS um, in his Wyoming Vegetable and Fruit Growing Guide. This will address almost anything you can think of in this area. And, and Mandy is going to be having a few of these. There's only like three or four of them um, for the drawing. But you can go online and you can download as little or as much of this as you want. I mean, if you hate parsnips, there's no sense in uh, downloading the parsnips uh, section. You know, so they're going to address um, like inoculation and, and, you know, pests, um, diseases, everything. I'm, I'm, oh, you, do you want to draw for these books? Okay. Um, so the last three digits are 166. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that will help. Nope. One four six. Maybe I should look. Maybe I want. Do we do another one? It was Patsy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Way in the back. Does he have one more? Okay. You have one more? Yeah. All right. One six five. <gasps> Yay! <laughs> okay. Thank you. Those they really are the the best growing books for Wyoming that I've seen. Yeah, those are great. Okay, so we're going to move on um, a little bit more to the point where um, that we've continued to keep the plastic on, our, on the soil to keep it warm for our warm season crops to go in because they like the soil much warmer um, and so we're avoiding the transplant shock. Um, so your tomatoes and your peppers and your squash and that kind of thing, again, you roll back your plastic. Um, one of the things I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, are aware of are, they're called walla waters. Have all of you guys seen these? Yes, yes. Has anybody not seen walla waters? Okay. So what these are, they have the little pockets in them and it's not easy to do. What you're probably going to want to do is where you're going to plant your tomato, go ahead and put like, if you don't put a large tomato cage right in there, put like four lath or stakes in here to hold this up and open. And then with your garden hose or with a watering can, you fill each one of these little tubes with water and it fills all the way up to the top. And then you know, your plant, your tomato plant or your pepper plant can be planted in here. And the nice thing about Walla Water is if you want, you, once they're full, you can collapse the top to help hold the heat in over the top like this if your tomato plant is fairly small. Um, but the whole idea of Walla Waters is these tubes of water gain solar heat throughout the day and then slowly release it at night. And so it really helps moderate that temperature, cutting down on your, um, you know, on your transplanting shock. Um, so we're also going to give away these. Um, there's two of them. But then there's most of us that are just cheapskates or um, don't want to mess with this. Some people leave these around their plants all season and that's okay too. Some of us do things like mm, the kitty litter jug. You get four of these, what are they, two gallon jugs? 
and put them around um, your tomato plants or peppers, there is a massive amount of warm water to really hold the heat in. And then at night, you've got a square about like this, you can just pop a, um, a corrugated cardboard box over the top if you're expecting some really cool weather or you know put your you know your old pieces of old quilts or whatever over the top to hold the heat in there but you're really holding the heat good with your bigger amounts of water. Water jugs, milk jugs, all of that stuff works just as well as your wall of waters but these of course are much tidier looking in the garden but you know these won't last long you can save your rain water in them and then use it to water those as you're taking them away from your plants so two wall of waters um, going together for one drawing okay. lucky table okay so then, then we get down to the cheapest, easiest thing that anybody can scavenge and do, old tomato cages. And then this would again be for, for trying to protect those warm season crops when you first stick them outside, protect them from the wind, protect them from the extremes in the temperature, and then you can slowly um, start opening them up and getting them exposed. But, um, you know, I, can you believe all the packing material available now? Let's, let's give it a second life. Um, this is some of the bigger bubble wrap. And you know, this is a nice thick um, wall of air pockets. So this is quite insulating and you can even double that around there. But you know, so you're sticking your tomato, um, the bottoms of your cage into the ground all the way up there. Make sure that you've got an, enough of the, of the bubble wrap to touch the ground and then enough to go over the top that you can close it up at night. Clothes pins work great in the garden for hooking things together. And so, again, you can open it up, fold it back during the day. You don't want to fry your tomatoes. Let's wait till you're doing your green fried tomatoes, not when you're first getting them started. And then also what works really well is some of this reme for doing the same thing or those sheer curtains. Again, it really, um, the sheer curtains will still let the light in, but it'll really diffuse that air and break, but it's not going to do, a, sheer curtain's not going to do much for holding the warmth in, but it will really break down that, that that hard wind that's coming at your plants. So those were a couple of the cheapo quick tip tips to get going early. But I do want to say that um, besides the, the book that you can check out, you know, check on, online and download what you want, this library has got an extensive collection of gardening books and the um, Extension office um, can line you up with bulletins if you want something more specific on soils or insects or that kind of thing. So be sure to utilize those resources. Um, and then, you know, another thing that I think is really imp important, you know, yeah, our weather's challenging, but we also need to challenge ourselves, challenge ourselves to be inventive and, and creative and, you know, Go through some back alleys and peek over the fences and see and see what neat things other people are doing for season extending and getting an early start. I mean, there's some cool stuff, and you know, and you know, if you really like it, go ahead and knock on their door because they're going to want to talk to you about it. They really are, you know, and share share your ideas too. Um, so the main thing, I guess, is you know, challenging yourself to do these things and have a lot of fun at it and then share that joy with the others. And I know I've run over time now, haven't I? So I'm okay, okay. So if there's time later for more questions, I'm sure I have more comments that I would like to make. <laughs> so um, anything else really quick, anybody? What's the, where do you download that book? Um, the website, where can they? You can go to the University of Wyoming Extension um, and then go to like the county offices. It's under their publications. Under publications? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it's just it's just ideal because it is it is information for our soils and our extremes and climate. So it's really it's a great book. So, okay. So next up is. I can. Yep, I can. Okay. So next up are Sandra and Heather doing, no? Kathy. Lizzie. 
Wendy. Who's coming next? It's Wendy. Thank you. You're welcome. If somebody wants one, they can have mine when, when I'm done. you all for having me um, actually recently I was doing a little inventory on my life and it occurred to me that I actually got to be friends with all of these master gardeners and wealth of information about 20 years ago that's when I first became a master gardener and I really can't stress enough that they're the professional here so um, I think my specialty actually is trees but I have a lot of experience also with perennials. That's where I started out as. I had a little business and um, worked a lot of garden walk yards for people. And uh, it kind of was my first real love was, was perennials. And of course, we've got the woody perennials tonight with roses. So um, let's get started. Um, there's a lot of types of roses, hundreds of them. Um, and so the major ones I'll go through are, you know, your hybrid tea roses. Those are your most popular. Uh, growing in small bushes, uh, 18 to 36 inches tall, and they usually bloom a single stem, or a single rose on a stem. So, but they also bloom all summer. So that's what makes them kind of popular. Uh, the Floribundas, they're similar to the hybrid teas, but they, uh, and they also bloom a single, but could also bloom a double. So you can get both of those on one stem. And then the Grandifloras, which are a hybrid cross between your Floribundas and your tea roses, um, kind of combines the best qualities of both. And they're vigorous with large clusters of blooms. So 
I think the next one is probably the more popular because they're the easier ones to maintain and probably you're more de disease resistant, but that would be your shrub roses. And then, of course, we have climbing roses and, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of different roses that we can go through. You've got your minis, uh, your old roses, English roses, uh, heritage roses, wild roses. Actually, there's quite a few wild roses that I absolutely love and I'm pretty partial to. So, um, The other thing is when you're planting, you want to check out your location. They do need sun at least six to eight hours a day, but preferably in the morning. I think I've had the most success is when they're getting that shade come about four or five o'clock if you can have them have some shade about that time of day. It helps them, I guess, not get too stressed out. Uh, soils, they prefer a loose, well-drained soil, um, plenty of organic matter, and they don't like soils that are too alkaline. So that puts us here in Wyoming in a bad spot, and you may need to go and fix that with some compost or organic matter. And just a little note, organic matter fixes everything, everything in your soil, and if you want a good plant, you start there. So that's a my little soapbox. Um, they do uh, need some timing, preferably after snowfalls or after the last snow and hard frost. So if you're starting a new rose, you want to hold off on that. Probably, I'm going to say, till after Memorial Day. That's a good rule of thumb to go with around here. We can have the possibility of snow even into June, but if you do end up planting a little early, make sure you get out and cover those up and protect them before if something comes up. How many of you go out and cover crops like crazy people? <laughs> yeah, it happens here. We, uh, we're in a, I, I, somebody spoke to it earlier, like we've had a little, a really rough winter and we're not actually had all of our snow leave until like two weeks ago. I would actually say that we're actually probably right on time with all of our snow and all of our frost and all of that. I think the difference this year is we've had a very bitter cold and a lot of it, and we had to look at that snow for a really long time. So I think we're all a little worn out and definitely excited to get out and get our hands in the dirt. Um, so um, potted plants only dig your hole as big as or as deep as your soil in your plant and a little bit wider. And like I said, if you can amend that soil a little bit with some compost and organic matter, you'll be a lot better off. Um, so remove the pot when the soil is actually dry and then you'll put it in. You may have to tease your roots a little bit and then um, you don't want your whole soil matter around your root to completely fall apart on you when you're putting it in your planting, planting pit, so to speak. Um, so yeah, set the, set the graft union. Do you guys know what, I t what a graft union is? So, gosh, I wish I would have brought one. Um, so a graft union generally is they've got this root system and they've grafted another piece on it. And you'll see essentially where the two have been brought together and grown together. Sometimes it'll still have a piece of tape, but you want that, and then you'll have that little bulge of, of union there where it's been grafted. So what you'll want to do is make sure you're at least two inches above. Let me make sure I've got this right. You want it two inches deep. <laughs> I'm a tree lady. I want it two inches above. For roses, you want it two inches deep. Make sure that's good and covered, and uh, then fill your water, uh, fill your soil, tamp it in in little levels similar to how you would another plant, and then water it in really good. Some people put a little well around their uh, around their roses, and then also you can use um, mulch or another type of organic matter to mulch over the top of it and help hold that moisture in. Rootstock, soak your rootstock before, you know, you bring it home, it's been sitting there in the store or nursery or whatever for days and it probably has this little bag of peat moss attached to it. When you get that home, take that off of there and put it in some water overnight and give it a nice soak before you go to plant. And then you'll go ahead and dig your hole, look for that little graft union, you wanna be two inches deep, and then 
basically I like to make like a little mound at the bottom of the hole, put those roots over the top of it, spread it out a little bit, and then start putting in your soil over the top. Um, again, create a, create a well around it, water it in good, and then, um, and actually when you go from rootstock, you're probably gonna need to tamp your soil in around that a little bit better to help hold it and get, make it sturdy. Um, and of course, mulching helps reduce weeds. Care, roses love water, but they don't want to sit in it. So giving them a, going out and watering them every day is essentially the equivalent to putting your head in the toilet and not being able to reach the flusher to get some air. All roots do need air, so it's really good to let that dry out a little bit in between and then give it another soak. So, um, I recommend about two to three times a week giving it a good drink. I wish I had a better, I wish I had a better like, if, say it takes half a gallon of water or something like that, but you really do just need to go out and put your finger in the soil and see if you're getting in enough water. Um, fertilizing. So for a strong, healthy rose that gives lots of blooms, a well-balanced fertilizer with nitrogen and a higher amount of phosphorus is recommended. So on your fertilizer bag, you'll have three little letters. They are N, P, and K. N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, K is potassium. Wyoming generally has a lot of potassium in our soil, so we're pretty good there. Nitrogen, you want a nice balanced number, I'm gonna say, Maybe around 15, that gives you good strength and turgor on your plant, the green part of it, but where you really want to be popping it with um, the phosphorus, that's going to give you good root and bloom. So if you want, and I think they make a lot of them, maybe miracle Grow even makes one. I'm personally not, I'm personally not a miracle Grow fan because you're out there putting it on every seven to 10 days. It's a very short release. So I like to use a little longer release and then, or slow release formulas. So you're not having to put that out there as much, but miracle Grow is great. I don't want to say anything bad about anything like that, but miracle Grow is great because it could really pop. Um, and if you're using that, that slow release formula throughout the season, and then say you've got a barbecue, a wedding, a baby shower, something showy you're wanting to do, you can come in a couple of weeks before and really start adding in that miracle Grow as well. So without really damaging your plants. Um, let's see, I think I go through some of that, the fast release. Um, winter protection, this is pretty important. Stop pruning your, uh, stop pruning and fertilizing in the fall. What you don't want to do is come along with miracle Grow and work that all the way up into October. It, the rose and most plants actually need to be able to use all of those extra nutrients and be able to get ready to go to bed. So when you're giving them that fertilizer too late in the season, they're basically still running that marathon, running that race, trying to be first, when really they need to slow down and do a little cooling period and have a little rest before they actually go dormant for the season. Um, another thing, oh yes, uh, winter, winter protection. I do quit, quit cutting all canes back, don't touch them anymore, and try to use some of your organic matter, either straw to put around your plants to protect them. I see some people use those white styrofoam uh, little cap things to put over the top, you can do that. Um, but mostly I like to just take and mow my leaves up and it kind of leaves that in chunks and then lay that in all of my bedding, but really pile it up around your roses. So pruning, the more you prune a rose, the more it will bloom. And I've got a little picture on this, this, and it basically shows the stem. You'll find an outward facing bud that is outward, um, outside of the plant. And then you're gonna make a 45 degree cut to the inside of that. What that's also going to do is force your new stem to go outward. And you, when you put more outward 
movement towards your stem and your cuttings, you're opening up that air circulation in between the plant. Um, roses are pretty notorious for some things. I'll get to that in a second, but you can deadhead throughout the season, um, wear good leather gloves, long sleeves. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them. They are abusive to me and I just don't mind. <laughs> so anyway, um, protect yourself if you need to. And then also what you wanna do is after you've had your bloom, it's died off, you're gonna go back down the stem and you wanna go to the first set of true leaves. The first set of true leaves, does everybody know what a true leaf is? It's your first set of five leaves. So sometimes they will have seven, they are usually in odds, but sometimes you'll get one that has like three, you know, an, on down the stem. But go back to the next, un, the next bud that has, is behind the set of true leaves, which is five. Um, like I said, make it a quarter, quarter of an inch above your outward facing bud. Um, gosh, oh, here's our diseases. Um, so the best way to keep roses free of disease, and this is why I say you might want to use a little nicer mulch during the year and pull back in the spring. After, I would wait until about Memorial Day to do this too. Pull back that organic matter that you put around your roses. Wait till um, after the chance of final frost. Um, but the best way to keep a good rose is, in most of your plants, is to have a good clean area for them, properly watered, properly fertilized, and good airflow through the plant itself. Um, th right here I have a list of uh, common diseases, uh, black spot, powdery mildew, botrytis blight. All of these are fungal and will You'll, powdery mildew is probably like the main one, but if you have to use that, you have to use a fungicide. I'm going to go on another soapbox here. <laughs> um, almost all plants have beneficial fungus in the soil, so if you end up having to use a fungicide, actually, as a, as a pesticide applicator, as a licensed pesticide applicator, please Take the opportunity to really look and find out what you're using, if you've diagnosed the plant properly, and if it really needs it. Because every chemical we put on it, number one, affects our pollinators, <laughs> and then also kills the beneficial fungi in the soil. That can also make or break the life of your plant. So. Um, Definitely look at that. You almost can't get away from having to treat a powdery mildew though. Um, the other ones are spider mites, aphids. Um, both of those can probably be washed with a good strong spray, but roses are a little more tender, so be careful with that. You may have to use an insecticide or a miticide for that. And then deer, you may have to protect them. Deer love rose hips. They're full of vitamin C and they will come and eat the heck out of your roses if you're not careful. So um, I've got just a few fun facts about roses here too. Roses are a woody, woody perennial. The rose family taxonomy includes apples, pears, peaches, cherries, plums, raspberries, almonds. Therefore, the fruits of the rose hips, you'll see them, they actually resemble a small crab apple. And by that I mean all of those fruits and nuts are actually part of the rose family. So that's where it all starts, is with the rose. Um, yeah? Are all rose hips edible? Um, I think so. I can't imagine they wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, the Rosaceae family is the is, is one of the most largest and most important crops in or commercially important crops simply because of all those things that I listed before. I mean all of your orchards, your nuts, your fruits all sort of start with, with that rose family. Um, roses are also one of the most popular flowers for florists. Where's Rich? <laughs> Um, so, I found this kind of interesting. So many people were allergic to rose, the scent of a rose, that they actually, if you've ever picked up a rose nowadays, especially a red one, 
It has no smell. They've bred that out of it so that they can sell more roses. Um, some of them I would say, which, what do you think are the most highly scented roses that you sell in, in the flower shop? The yellow? Yeah, the yellow ones. Some of the white ones. Um, Purple, maybe. Yeah. Yep, they've completely bred the smell out of that so that they can send, sell more red roses on Valentine's Day. Which. It's probably the, as far as a commercial crop and a, and a rose, that's the most sold rose is the red rose. And yeah, so many people were allergic that they bred it out. Um, roses are the birth flower of June. Yay me! <laughs> Born in June. And uh, cultivation of roses actually began over 5,000 years ago in China. So. Um, and in the 7th, 17th century, roses were actually used for legal, legal tender, like money, by the royalty. So, do you guys have any questions? Do you prefer a rootstock or a potted rose? It, I actually do buy a lot of potted ones, to be honest. Um, I don't. I, Gosh, I hate. I don't. I don't feel like Jackson Perkins roses do well here, and I see them sold a lot, but I just don't think they make it. I will say my favorite, and it's a, it's a bush rose or a shrub rose, is the Morden family of roses. They absolutely will go crazy, shoot, twelve foot out, and bloom mad madly. Can you say the name of that again, please. Um, Morden. Um, more than they're um, I don't I haven't really seen them in a in a red. They're more of a white, pink. I've seen them in sort of that tequila rose color that goes from the yellow to the to the orange to the pink. Lots of whites with like a blush to them, but they absolutely will be huge. They've got a a span of like I said, they'll get 12 foot wide and 15 foot out. They'll go like crazy. Where do you get them? Um, most of your nurseries will have them. Here? I mean... Your nurseries are your greenhouses. I don't see them a lot in your big box stores, but I don't shop there for plants anyway. Um, I have an old <coughs> rose bush that I've had in probably 15 or 18 years. And it's a small bush and I want to move it. Is it possible to transplant dig it up and move it somewhere else and when would be the best time to do that? Um, yes. It never gets very big at all. I don't remember what kind it is. I, I will say yes, it is absolutely possible to do that when you do it. Just make sure that you take as much of that root, um, root system as you possibly can. Some of those smaller ones I, I did say something I will correct myself on. Um, I do believe a hedge rose is one that you should not cut back too far. So be a little bit careful with those. But you should be able to do it. I would wait until the ground's thawed. Does it bloom for you all season or just once? Um, it blooms late in the, uh, starts blooming probably around July and it'll bloom July and August, and then, yeah, just pretty much once, but it blooms for a long time during that period. Yeah. Um, you might want to wait until fall to do that. I love... I love transplanting things in the fall because they've already gone dormant for the season. And when you do things like that on a cold, rainy, cool day, it's like plant anesthesia. They don't even know it's happening. They're already starting to go dormant. <laughs> it, it is. It's like they wake up and they're in their new happy place next spring and things are great. You might wait, but if you wanted to do it this spring 
and, and really take care of it. But I, I would say if you did it this spring, you're probably not going to get a bloom this year. You'll have to wait a whole year. Otherwise, I think fall after it's done, blooming would be your best chance. Just be really careful and water it a bunch because that's the challenge we have. Usually falls are pretty dry around here. So you really need to provide supplemental watering. Yes. Yes, but and I, I don't know. Do any of my other master gardeners in here want to speak to that? Because that is probably also sometimes these plants can outlive their useful life. So I don't know. What do you guys say about that? Do I have any other rosebush people? I would say that's. I, I do. Have you? Yeah. Have you I mean, been fertilizing at all? The, the, the canes on it are just huge and they're massive. But that, yeah, it sounds to me like that's exactly what happened. Is that your is that your miniature rose has, and and your your root stock of your bigger rose is done? Because actually. Almost all of them are hybrids and, and done like that, but actually miniature roses are pretty famous for being grafted onto a bigger stock. So I think you're on the right track. I would say, yeah, get some organic matter is, is what I would do. Um, I usually use the iron more for like lawn yellowing, <laughs> not as much on my plant stuff. But again, I'm a tree person. I really don't care about grass. <laughs> I do. I take that back. I have to maintain a lawn. We all do. But anybody else? Do you prune a climber the same as a bush rose? No. You don't, like I said, usually if you have a bloom, you want to let that go and climb. Rich talked a little bit about sort of pruning off the stuff at the bottom and allowing it to go. If you're going to prune, those blooms really only go back as far as you have to to get to that uh, true leaf. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, always a fun time to come and visit. And taking this off. Oh, I apologize for my weed shirt, but they are pollinators. <laughs> and you might get some wine out of them. I don't know. It goes out of rose shirts, I suppose. <laughs> So Patsy is a longtime master gardener and she is going to share with us about herbs really fast. She needs to have <laughs> you need the microphone. Oh, do I? Okay. So the people on the video can all oh, okay. Okay. Herbs are fun. They're really fun. They're pretty, they're mostly edible. And they're primarily, primarily easy to grow. They, most of them are native to inclement weather like we have. I mean, poor soil, they come from Greece and they come from the Mediterranean where it's dry and poor soil. And they come from Russia and just Siberia. I mean, they come from Wyoming-like weather. <laughs> it's just what they do. So they like it here. That's one of the very few things that we can actually grow that we don't have to worry about so much. Okay. Um, Patsy, can we get you a microphone? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. She's 
usually not this quiet. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Where's the on button to this? It's on the very bit bottom. On the what? Bottom. On the bottom. Wasting all my time here. <laughs> Gave me five minutes and boy. Does it work? Oh, it does. Hey. Okay. Why won't it work? Good. Thank you. Oh, it went. There it went. Okay. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Kind of. Okay. Doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're growing roses or gardening or herbs, it really doesn't matter. There are five evils of Wyoming gardening. You've heard some of them talked about. Wind. Everybody has that, and it, it's going to affect your herbs, even, even if they're not supposed to. Uh, temperature fluctuations. Temperature, the temp, cold temperature isn't as bad as the fluctuations. It's the days that we have this 50 degree weather, then we go below zero the next day. That is really bad. This year it's probably been the best because we have ground cover this year. We never have snow cover. Usually it blows off, then it gets 40 degrees and then it turns below zero. That's when we really have problem. And you see that in a lot of trees already this year. They're, they're just terrible, some of the trees are. And most of that came from temperature fluctuations. Not this year, most, most of your tree problems don't show up, but last year or the year before. Okay, lack of water. I mean, most of our places don't have water where we plant a lot of our stuff. Uh, poor soil high pH, a lot of uh, the salt binds all the chemicals that the plants need. And we might have a lot of calcium, but we will still show a calcium deficiency in our soil because our plants can't use it because of the salts. It's bound in there. So, and then you see, here's another soil problem, heavy soils. So everybody has these same problems. So herbs, no different. Okay, any of these evils can drop you a full point on your uh, zone. You know, if we live in a zone three, it can be in a zone two if one of these things happen. Well, they all happen. But they, with enough time and money, you can fix absolutely anything. So just be patient and get out your wallet. But keep them in mind if you have a little bit different microclimate in certain parts of your yard. Okay, one of the best ways to learn about herbs and plants, any plants, is to read your seed catalogs. They're usually free, they have unbelievably good information. So, the other way is to come to the Herb Fest that the Master Gardeners put on this year. It is August 12th at Camplex in the park, and we'll have samples, we'll have classes, we'll have crafts, we'll have all sorts of goodies. So. That's, and we also have a small herb bed out there. So you can come out there and see what, see what we have. And you can learn a lot out there. Okay, some of the reasons to grow herbs. You can bathe in them. Wow. You can cook with them. Janet's got, Janet's got a handout with uh, some cooking information. Um, crafts with herbs, scented things, teas, lotions. You can dye your stuff. You can companion plant with herbs. Oh, I think I, I think we could move off that. There we go. Okay. You can even use herbs as house plants. Jody's got a, uh, a rosemary plant that, how old is it, Jody? 25 years old? Yeah. She's got a 25 year old house plant that's an herb. Okay. Also, you can do healing with herbs, but we as horticulturally tr trained master gardeners can't talk to you about that. <laughs> you have to do that on your own if you want. Also, it's your responsibility to research. S some of these herbs are poison. 
definitely poison. They might be, you know, a little dog eating them can really kill a dog or a kid. So positively identify anything and do your homework before you plant. Make up your mind what your goal is. You need, and Wendy talked about this a little bit, Gillette is a B-City USA classification. We educate the public about helping pollinators and planting food or blossoms for the pollinators. And that's what our goal was with our herb bed out at Camplex. Our goal was to feed pollinators because we have all those fruit trees out there and we need them pollinated. Nobody's gonna go out there with a paintbrush and you know, pollinate it, every little bottom blo blossom. So we want, we want some bee or pollinator, whatever, whatever it is, to do that for us. Okay, but before you buy any seeds or plants, you have to decide what you want. Do you want the pollinator garden? Do you want for food? Do you want for color? Do you want any, you know, make teas? You can, you know, have your specific beds. Okay. Oh, library has a lot of books, so do your research with the library books that are here. And magazines, they have some good herb magazines too here. Okay. Before you plant, you need to know the difference in the cycles. Simply, and they've talked about it before, the annual, biannual, and perennial. The annual, they grow, bloom, go to seed, die, all one year. Biannual takes two years to complete this cycle. They germinate and make vegetative plants and in the first year, and then the second year they bloom and go to seed and then they die. Perennial just continues for at least three years, so. Okay. So, if we live back east, we might not be able to plant a lot of these things. People back east just absolutely love gray plants because gray plants are usually adapted to dry climates. That's what they're for, why they're gray. And people back east just can't do that. So we do have a few things that we can just really do on our own. Okay, growing your herbs is the cheapest the chi uh, from, from seed is the cheapest way of going about it. Well, actually, the cheapest is borrowing some from your neighbor or your friend. That's really, uh, there's a lot of them that really, really transplant real nicely. So that's the cheapest, but it's better, I think, to grow your own from seed because you know what you're getting. Those seed catalogs don't d indiscriminately just put anything in. They keep their stuff really well, well, documented. So if you buy if you buy a seed pla packet from a seed company and it says rosemary on it, it's going to be rosemary just about always. So that that makes you safer and you know what you're giving your kids and you're not going to you're not going to be putting something out there that will kill your dog. So and for some reason they love to chew on herbs. I don't know why. Cats kind of do too, so anyway, you need a sunny spot and most of your herbs can be started by seed, just sowing the seed in the soil at the place. Uh, I don't have very much time, so I just went through and picked out five of my favorite varieties and that are quick and easy to grow and will give you a nice herb garden. Then you can start moving out into other things. So, basil, my favorite is sweet Genovese. It has to start indoors seven days under fluorescent lights or, and after sprouting, you need to put a little fan up because that damping off that, that uh, she was talking about on roses, that can affect basil pretty easy too. So, then, once, the, once they're growing, regular deep watering is probably the best for every herb, doesn't matter what kind, unless it's specific. But uh, deep watering is much better than just a lot of little light waterings. 
harvesting on basil, you wait until the plant's about 10 inches high, then you go down about six leaf nodes from that and harvest when you get, a, get another six leaf nodes after that. And it won't be as much as you see in the catalog, or if you live in Missouri, it won't be, you won't get a lot of those. But just keep watching and just cut down like that. Janet's passing around some basil. It's just what we had. It's not my favorite, but they're parsley. all good. Parsley. Or parsley, I mean. Yeah, not basil. Yeah, we changed. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I like, oh, a pot of, a pot of basil different colored basil, light, roughly leaves, different textures, different colors, just four different plants in one pot will just make the prettiest little little pot that you can plant out. Also, uh, if you put a little marigold in it or something, that really makes it attractive. And marigold's an herb too, so edible. You don't want your uh, basil to go to seed or to flower. That makes the leaves tough and they lose their, lose their flavor. So you want to make sure you, you keep cutting that off down into the leaves a little bit. So you need to get rid of that. Also, let's see. Oh, chives. I don't know a variety. I don't. You look in the catalog, but once in a while you see one, but mostly they just say chives. So I think they're just chives. <laughs> but they grow really well, and they grow good from seed. And then once you get a, a clump going, then you can just cut it up and share with your friends and, or start a whole bunch of them. They make a nice border. They're also companion planting to roses. I don't know if you'd want garlic in your, or chives in your roses, but I don't know. Carrots, grapes, tomatoes, apples, and cucumbers are com companion planting for that. So some of that first little thing that you, the first little, little doctor, what, what is that little, yeah, that little, what is it called? Whoa, I can't go. Oh, it's called a garden planner. It used to be called Dr. Bob's or somebody like that. Clyde's, yes, that's what it was, it was Clyde's. So anyway, that gives you some companion planning on that one too. Okay, the, the next easy to grow simple thing is cilantro or coriander. Cilantro is the leaf part of a coriander and the seed is coriander. So you can, you can plant your cilantro, you can, it says plant about every two weeks a new crop because it grows so fast, it's unbelievable. So, and it doesn't transplant very well and don't fertilize it either. A lot of herbs don't want fertilizer at all. Matter of fact, most of them don't want it. But once they flower, the leaves lose their flavor, so let those plants continue to flower and it'll form a little tiny round herb that will be your coriander. If you have a recipe for used coriander, you got lots of it. And then if you let just a few fall to the ground, you're gonna have some next year too and it's perpetual. You probably won't ever get rid of it. Uh, another simple one is dill. And Ducat is the best, I think. They have a bunch of new ones and I haven't tried them, but D-U-K-A-T has a lot of green leaves on it. So you can use it for your dill weed when you, you know, and then it doesn't flower as fast or as much and sometimes they'll be smaller and so, the pollinators like to eat on your dill, but unless you're doing dill pickles, they never come out, the tops of the seeds never come out at the right time for your dill pickles. You always end up having them at the wrong place at the wrong time. So the Ducat gives more leaves and you can use the leaves more. Again, plant directly in the soil. Don't need to buy transplants and do your research, find out if there is a shorter one. There might be. Okay, so here we come to parsley. Mo moss curled is my, my favorite one. I don't know if there's a new one. They don't usually have too many, but this one that you got the seeds of, I've never planted, so I can't exactly say what that one is. But it's not, it's, what I like is the moss curled and it's not as flavorful as the flat or the Italian leaf parsley. If you're doing a lot of stews and things like that, the parsley, 
the flat leaf has better flavor. But I think that trades off with the prettiness of these, of the curled, and also I don't mix it up with cilantro. Oh, we got a picture of cilantro here. I don't know if we're going to have. Maybe we have no pictures. I don't know. Anyway, we won't worry about it. Um, here again, the rest of those, well, most of them are per, uh, annuals. Parsley is a biannual. It grows up, you get pretty leaves, you cut them off. The next year, it comes back gets more pretty leaves, then it starts a flower stalk and goes to seed and then it dies. But it's already planted your next year's crop. So you always have one going and you can keep one going for a long time, 10 years or more. If you wanna keep your, your plants in the same place, you might not want to do that, keep your bed. I had a lot of parsley this last year and last three or four years. I dried, in 18, I dried a half a gallon of dried parsley. And those little things, that's a lot of parsley. Way more than anybody needs. I gave it away and I did all sorts of things. But, but mostly, you, when you let anything go too long, self-seeding itself, it still needs, after 10 or 15 years, needs some new, because that seed gets old. I don't know why, whether it, uh, I don't know whether the genetics get, get mixed up in it and it doesn't have any new viable stuff, I don't know. But if you just a little, little bit of seed on it out of a new plant, then you'll, it'll keep forever. I don't know if you'll ever run out. Okay, the parsley seeds are from our seed library. Camp Master Gardeners have a seed library down in the extension office at 412 Gillette, South Gillette Avenue, the old George Amos building. And you can go in there and look through the seeds and take, where's Mandy, five? Ten. Ten now, or you can get ten. Ten seed packets of whatever you want. We don't have a lot of herbs. We had a, had a lot of this, but mostly we don't have a lot of herbs. But you can go down and look, and they're free. You just have to write down how many you're taking and what you're taking, and then you can have some seeds. Uh, we, we usually get them from seed companies that we write and ask for, and they donate last year's seed. So it's not uh, this year's seeds, it's last year's seeds that they can't sell anymore. And it, we have a book there that will tell you how long your seed's supposed to last, and most of it's pretty true. Uh, you know, you can't guarantee any of that, but Janet and I one time went through and took all the well, from the community garden, but we took all the, the uh, leek seeds because leeks are only supposed to last a year, and these were five years old and six years old, so we just put them in my compost. The next year I had a lawn of leek seeds. I mean, what did, by the time they came up, they were, it was too late to plant them because they had to take a long growing season, and I just had this lawn of leeks. I didn't, couldn't do anything with them, but they were pretty. But you can't always trust a seed to tell you exactly how long it's going to live. Yes? I got some really old seeds gifted to me, and I started them this year, and I started some Liberator tomatoes from 1987. I planted 1978 tomatoes. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I plant 1978 tomatoes. I got a big bag, and I'm never going to get rid of it in my lifetime. I mean, 1978. But I, but I keep my seeds in a glass jar with uh, a little packet of, uh, well, I use, uh, I use powdered milk. Fold it up in a Kleenex and put it in the bottom and then make sure it's sealed and then keep it in a black garbage bag, or I keep it in a, in a box and put that box in a black garbage bag so it stays dry and it stays cool and it doesn't have any sun in it and like I said I'm planting 1978 tomato seeds and if you need any I got lots <laughs> I don't know how long they'll last but anyway stop by and look at all those seeds that we have and don't forget our May 4th tree sale 
and go out and experiment. That's the big thing. You go out, you try things. You don't, don't be afraid to plant some weird thing. Don't, don't worry about it. I mean, if it grows, it does. If it doesn't, you're not out too much. <laughs> no, it doesn't take much, so. Who do we have next? Sandra. Yes. I'm just going to leave it on. <laughs> I think I just need you. This. We did just have a question. Our office is open 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, we don't break for lunch or anything. We, there's somebody there at all, all times. Do I have to? Where's the thing? You should have had Cassie bring her. I should have. I should have brought them and passed them out, and then you guys could have planted them. Although I don't really care for the type of tomatoes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. They were from Astro, I think, company, and they were an experimental, and it's a pretty fat bag. It's pretty full of seeds, so. Were there any other questions? Okay, you ready? I am. Um, I'm going to tell you about a flower that grows forever and doesn't, you don't have to give it any care at all. Do you believe me? No. People think when they plant perennials that they never have to do anything with them and they're going to stay in their yard all the time with little care. It's a lie. But perennials are great flowers. They can last 20 years or they can last three years. It depends on the type that you have. So I'm going to give you a few pros and cons of perennials. And I dug some up from my yard because one good thing about perennials and people talk about them is you can share them. And I have planted daisies that aren't perennials that always come up in the same spot. They seed and come up everywhere. So I dig them out every year and I toss some away. And if I know people who want them, I leave them out on my, okay, I see you, Rich. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm going to give you some pros and cons on perennials. One is all perennials, most perennials have a bloom. Okay, they're flower. The con of that is their flowers are short-lived. I mean, if you're going to plant a perennial bed, you have to figure out when the flowers are going to bloom. And if you only plant one kind of flower, when June is over, you just have green. So when you're planting a perennial bed, you have to know about the flowers, how they go together, and when they're going to bloom. OK, perennials usually die back. So if I have a bleeding heart, I planted it last year. And at the end of the season, you can't tell where your bleeding heart is unless you mark it. So, but in spring, you go out there and you have little shoots of green coming up and your bleeding heart is back for the next year. Same with iris. Um, the bleeding heart goes back, it's a plant, um, and iris is a tuber, it's a rhizome. rhizome, thank you very much. And, but it does die back. You, you don't see iris in December. All right, so in the spring, it's going to come up. And when you're buying plants right now, and you go out and buy a perennial, you'll say, oh, look at it. I got it from the store. It's up already. But guess what? If I go and put that out, and in somebody's yard, it hasn't started coming up yet, it's just, it's, it's not going to live. All right? So a good rule of thumb is to look around your neighbors, and when their plants start coming up, you know you can probably go out and plant your new one after you harden it off. And I got off my topic. <laughs> OK, so another one is um, I talked about they come in varieties. You can have bulbs. You can have plants. You can have tubers. You can have rhizomes. But one of the cons of that is, you know, I don't know about you, but I really love dahlias. 
But in our zone three, dahlias are not a perennial. They're an annual. So if you want to keep them, you have to go out and dig them up and store them. And I'm pretty lazy about that, and they're really cheap in some of the stores, so I just plant them every year. <laughs> Mainly because I've dug them up, and I don't care for them correctly, and they don't come up the next year. So, um, um, dahlias, gladiolas in our zones, you really have to, you can't keep them out, okay? Um, we talk about perennials, they can last for years, but you still have to care for them, okay? I wanted to, um, I have some, this is the soil from my yard. Um, I dug up my, you want to just walk it around, Heather? This is the kind of soil that I'm dealing with at mine. I have clay in my backyard. I've lived in my house for 48 years, and I've amended my soil all that time, and this is what you're looking at that I'm gardening in, okay? In Pardon? You live in Roseanne? I know, I live in Gillette. <laughs> but, I, right. So, um, I'm telling you, I brought the plants here, and that soil that you're looking at, they're growing in it right now. So I, I still get beautiful flowers in really crummy soil. Um, when your, your bed is established, you still need to care for it. Because what happens to perennials a lot of times is they die out in the center. If you've ever had grown Autumn Joy, which is a sedum, um, I got some from my mom's house, what, 40 years ago. And I brought it and I planted it. Well, it grows beautifully and it gets big, but pretty soon the center is dead. And so, what you do, your plant isn't dead, but you have to take it out of the ground, trim off the new growth, get rid of the center, and plant it back. So you do still have to take some care of your perennials. Um, and you'll see a lot of perennials who do that. Ladies' mantle does that too. So if, if that's what it does, realize that sooner or later you're going to have to replant your plants in. But you don't have to buy new plants because the perennial has, it's still growing. All right. Um, perennials have pretty easy propagation and I mainly do mine just by division. I just, I dig them out because it gets crowded. Um, so some plants are annual. I have a and he's in pretty bad shape. I dug these up. I dug these up Monday. Um, this is my daisy, okay. Um, and this is the hard hard soil. But this daisy is the one that will reseed. So it this plant isn't exactly a perennial, but because it seeds, I don't have to plant it next year because it's already in my garden. So it's considered a perennial. And that's like tulips, they're a bulb. That's a perennial. It's going to come back every year, or daffodils. So um, if you're going to buy perennials, if you buy them from a store or you order them online, you need to read what they need to, to grow. Um, you can get a book here. You could go online. You can go to the extension service. Um, you need to know its growing habits, how tall it gets, its flowering season, um, the kind of soil it needs, if it tolerates our zone. Like, I like dahlias, but it's a lot of work to have them the next year. Um, and let's see, it, uh, if it needs winter protection and how much sun it needs. Most perennials need a lot of sun. They're a sun plant. Um, if you're going to divide your perennials or propagate them, whatever, it's, it's better to do it in the spring. So, and you lucky people here. Um, I hate throwing out my perennials. So, I'm going to show you kind of what some of them look like. And then, I'm going to send them home with you. <laughs> so, this is my daylily. Um, I probably have 40 of these in my yard, and I started with six. 
So they do spread. And so um, this is the old kind of daylilies. I have orange flowers, and they're probably four feet tall. Um, you have your thing, and then you have your big stem coming out. Um, I don't know if you can see. Um, they're kind of like tubers. And if you get a little bit and you leave it in, um, they grow. And so these are my, I dug these up too. And they're the same thing, but they just came up on their own. So I have these all over my flower bed. And um, so I don't have a perennial bed per se. I just have what grows. And if it grows, it stays in my yard. And if it doesn't grow, I don't care because it's gone. Um, and these are my daffodils. And pretty soon your daffodils are going to be in. Um, this is just a clump of them. And I would have started out maybe with one bulb on these. And they just like my yard. And they're, they're growing in the clay. So generally when I dig, I dig with a fork. Um, so I can go down in without cutting the bulb in half. Um, and like I say, I dig them up. Sometimes I replant them. My housing area has a, a Facebook page. So I put on, um, I might have irises out in front of my house. First come, first serve. Come get them, you know. I do that. So this is my daffodil bulb in the clumps. And I'll have quite a few of them. And like I say, they don't look like much, but give it a couple years. Um, I don't know if I have enough for everyone. They were talking about maybe doing a drawing, but if, if your ticket's already been drawn. Um, oh, and looky here. I have a daylily bulb in with them. So um, I'm trying to think if I said everything. Um, oh, best in the spring if you're going to divide best in the spring. But if you have bulbs, usually you have to plant them in the fall and then they will come up in the spring, except for if they're dahlias or gladiolus. And I'm sure there's some more. So, um, if, if it's a root, a fibrous root, what right. do you What? How do you divide it? You're dividing bulbs. OK, no, this is my daylily. Um, again, I usually do my fork or my knife. <laughs> I'm just, and I'm telling you, I'm working with my my clay soil and it may be a and you think oh my gosh she's killing these suckers <laughs> nah <laughs> I'm just gonna and usually they're a little more moist because I kind of try to water them before <laughs> um, but I'm just going to cut sections of them and and you know I don't I don't really care if the whole batch doesn't come back because if one of them sprouts then I've got another plant and I probably have lots of them anyway but <laughs> yes please do <laughs> and if if your numbers called and Kim all kind of knows what my yard looks like. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me, if you'll open one of these bags up.
Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, let me give you. You want daffodils? You want? Okay. Is this both the same thing? Um. Yes, they're both the same. These are daffodils. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, that's got a big hole in it. Oh, that's probably not a good idea. Um, yeah, there's a Shasta Daisy too. Oh, okay. See, look at that. That's a daylily. Hmm? And this is a this is a little dry, so they'll need to. I hope I have enough bags. I don't trust you with me. No, it's. Okay. So what are those? These are daffodils. What was the last one, Mary? You want a date, Lily? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's what I was. I'm That's what you were hoping for? Yeah. I was going to buy some. <laughs> okay, about. Um, about one more after that. Oh, oh sorry. That's okay. There you go. How about that one? Okay. What is this? No, that's, that's the daffodil. daffodil. Yeah. Oh, that's I, mean, I think that's the last set. <laughs> yeah. I'll get it. I'm picky. Yeah. I wanted the chairs down there. Or? Um, that's it. Here. This, okay. Here's a day lily and a daffodil in there. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. How do you keep the bowls? Oh, they just clean them out. Oh, oh, the right. You can sprinkle oh, them. Right. There's and some kind of a, a spice that you can sprinkle around and they won't come. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. I, it's not cinnamon, but um, just do. I've got. Did you get yours? Okay. I've got two left. Thank you. rabbits and bowls. Oh yeah. Just. I'm shooting the rabbits. Okay. One seven two. This is a different. This is okay, a does anybody have any questions about perennials? You you put the daffodils in in the fall. You get the bulbs and you put them. You could plant them now, but you might not get a flower. Oh, this one. You can go plant it when the. No, no. Go ahead and you can plant all these, but you might not get flowers off, especially the daffodils. Uh, my daffodils are blooming in my yard right now, so. <laughs> what? Oh. But I don't think I have one. But if you want one, I will bring some. Anyway, as you can see, my soil is pretty crummy. Yes. So I have several perennials that have already, when I went to no I mean you might get a little die back but it's frosted but plants usually come up when they're supposed to come up okay well you could probably cover if you wanted like I have lots of leaves still left in my and I I might put it over but pretty much I leave mine alone um, I do have some mulch around them. Right, right. They're, they're really, perennials are pretty hardy plants. So, anything? You found a bag of bulbs that you bought last fall and forgot to plant. Okay, the question is, if you bought bulbs last year and you didn't get planted, can you plant them this year? What you need to do is squeeze them. If they're soft, because the leaves of the bulb, you don't want to cut those off on any of them. It provides the food for the bulb for the next year. And if you cut off, if you're tulips, you know, no more tulips and you have all this green stuff and it's looking kind of, don't cut that off. That's providing the food for the next year. Um, so squeeze those bulbs. If they're soft, then mm, no, no, nah get rid of them. But if they're still hard in the middle, you, sh you, you might not get a beautiful flower next year. It might come back really small, 
but it will eventually okay. you'll get something. Okay. So don't okay. put that greenery off on your leave it there. On your tulips, on your daffodils, any bulb that comes up or like your hyacinth, leave it on because that is providing the food in the bulb for the next group the next year. And I've seen a lot of landscapers will go and tie a knot with all those daffodil leaves to make it look tidy. Don't do that. It's, it's that they need the whole leaves to get their, their energy for the next year. Yeah, kind of made a mess. Yeah, I've got two more in there. To give yeah, away. I see that. How about we just do one like this? You can't, you can't do it without it. <laughs> We're having projector issues. Oops. It's Excuse me. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Oh, you it? I know has grown it. Um, but just, this is the hard part about being last, is everybody's already said what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so one, the first thing you got to do is see where you want to put something. See how much sun you have. What was planted there before? Is it going to conflict? Like, I didn't know that you don't plant raspberries where there's been tomatoes or potatoes or any nightshade plant before until I did this research. I would have I would have just plopped them in there. You gotta wait two years, he said. Just because of the soil pathogens that are in there. They say wait two years. I didn't I've never heard that before. All my information that I got, um, I relied on university um material. Um oh, thanks. Um, I, it was the University of Wyoming, um, Minnesota, and Wisconsin is where I got. I'll, that's where, I mean, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Not all of it is true. A lot of it is. So look at your source. Make sure your source is right. Make sure that it's comparable to where you are. You look at Minnesota, or, you know, they're comparable to us. But you look at Florida's extension, you know, it's not going to be the same. So you have to, to look at where your source is coming from. So after you've looked at your spot, see how much sun it has, then you decide, all right, when I'm going to shop for plants, always look for the zone. I do zone four or less. I have experimented with five and had good luck, but not always, or it goes for a couple years. Um, then you want to say, all right, berries. What kind of berries do I want? What am I going to do with it? Am I going to want to make jelly with it? Am I just going to want to walk by and pick it? Am I growing these for the birds? You know, a lot of people do. There are a lot of berry um, bushes that people don't like rose bushes. The, they grow the roses, they like the roses, but they leave them on the hips for the birds. So you got to you got to think of well what kind of berry do I want? What do I want to do with it? Um, what kind of flavor do I want? Do I want picking and canning? Because some berries, when you pick them, they don't taste so good until you add sugar. Choke cherries, you know, they're pretty they're pretty tart, you know. Um, and the other thing you got to look at when you're picking it is some berries are not. Um, self-pollinating. That means you need two different kinds. So you got to think of what space you're going to have for, you're going to have to grow at least two bushes close to, in proximity. So that's, and I don't have any slides. <laughs> so you guys, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to tell you about them. <laughs> sorry. Um, some of the bushes that, that I had pictures of, they're beautiful bushes. Um, the elderberry is a beautiful bush with beautiful flowers. You could grow it 
just for the flowers and not for the berries. You know, so that's always in thinking of, do I want an ugly bush, you know, grow a, um, uh, a honeyberry. It's not a very pretty bush, but it grows good berries if you can get them to grow. <laughs> so anyway, all right, so my first one is a black choke berry, not choke cherry, choke berry. And it's a medium-sized shrub. It's a zone three through eight. Um, that's one of the ones that's not so good raw. You want to turn it into jellies or, um, or jams or, and that one, I looked where people sell it, and that's sold by High Country Gardens. So I know that they are a pretty reliable catalog. So I trust what they say, you know. Um, these also will sucker like raspberries sucker. Then there's the blueberry. Everybody wants blueberries. They're zoned for here. The zone is right, but the soil is not. Blueberries like a lot of acidity. So um, people say, well, put peat moss in. Well, peat moss holds water. Clay soils hold water. Blueberries don't like that. They don't like a lot of water. They like free draining stuff. And after a while, your peat moss is done, and then your um, blueberries aren't so lovely anyway. I tried to grow them in a pot. I thought, all right, I can control the environment in a pot. A lot of people think of that, so I tried it. Well, all right, the blueberries did okay. I mean, I didn't get any fruiting the first year, but to winter them over, I thought, well, I have this nice clay pot. I'm going to turn it over. It's zone two. It was a zone two blueberry, I which was crazy. Um, and I'll just not let the pot crack because if you leave a pot out, a, a ceramic one, and the freeze thaw, freeze thaw will crack your pot and then you don't have that nice pot. So I tipped it over. I didn't go out and water it like I should have. So what happens is it still freezes and thaws. It's just not breaking the pot, but the water's draining out of those blueberries. So in order to overwinter blueberries, in a pot, you have to find a place where it, you, it'll freeze like an ice cube and stay that way all winter. Because if it doesn't, if it thaws some and the water drains away from the roots, then it freezes again. And you know how your um, freezer stuff gets freezer burned? Well, that's what the roots are doing. If there's no moisture at those roots, they're burning and they're dead. So that it's just so hard. So I'm going to throw, I'm not going to do blueberries in a pot. It's too much work. So the, I asked um, the nursery manager from where I work, and he said to, the only thing he knows to do is you get the soil acidifier fertilizer, and you do it all the time. Because they need, you're, you're trying to lower a pH. Uh, blueberries like pH, um, it's like, I didn't write it down. But it's, we're, we're, we're like seven. It wants it down by five to be really happy. So you're really trying to change that pH of soil. And that's, that's a continual process. How much work do you want to put into it? And how long? When you quit adding that acid into your blueberries, they're going to quit being happy. Um, another one that, I, um, that I, I'm trying this year, and I grew it from seed, is a ground cherry. And it's an annual. Not all berries have to be perennials or a bush. This is an annual. It's a relative of a tomatillo. Um, but it's, so it's in that paper covering. You can see in the picture. It's pretty cute. Yeah, and um, so, but it's kind of bitter also. It, it's a round yellow. You take the paper off. They call it a ground cherry because when the fruit drops to the ground is when it's ripe. And um, that makes really good syrup, syrup and jams. Um, and I did see a recipe for coffee cake with it. I'm going to ask me next year how it went, okay? Because <laughs> I've got them growing. They're up about this tall. I'm real excited about it. We want samples next year. Yeah, I'll bring coffee cake. Yeah, <laughs> a little jam with some scones. Yeah. Okay, um, choke cherry is a zone two. Um, it can be a tree or a bush, so you got to plan what you want. 
Um, I said the, the fruit is kind of bitter and there are little tiny berries. The seed is poisonous, so you don't want to eat the seed. You don't want to make jam. You have to make jelly or syrup. Um, it is good for the wildlife, though. And there is one problem, and maybe if I'm wrong, I know somebody in here will correct me, but that the choke cherry um, wood is weak. So like if you get heavy snows, your branches will break. So that's a problem with, and then you have all that open, ready for diseases or insects or whatever. That's how I lost mine, was the heavy snow. Um, so the next one is the current gooseberry and jostaberry. Now I'd never heard of jostaberries, but they're zoned for here. They're zone three. Um, they're all in the same family. Now currants makes a pretty bush. Um, they do like a little bit more shade. Um, blueberries also like afternoon shade if you want to try blueberries, which I probably talked you out of it. <laughs> um, most of the currants, gooseberries, and jostaberries are self-fertile, so you just need one. You don't have to make a row of them. Um, but they do benefit from cross-pollination. If you do have an oven, the berries will be bigger. Um, they ripen later in the spring. They, could, they love our soil, so that's a big plus. That's why you probably see a, people with a lot of currants. It'll grow here. The neighbor across the street from me, like a weed. It got huge. And the birds brought it over to my house. Um, and those are a bush, right? Yes, yes. They're pretty bush. Then it, they are, they are. Um, currants don't have thorns where gooseberries have nice little thorns. The gooseberries are a bigger fruit. They're green, and you've got to fight the thorns for them. Um, and neither of those have very many diseases to worry about that I could find. The jostaberry is a cross between the um, currant and the gooseberry, and it's or a currant, a black currant and a gooseberry. And it does not have thorns either. And I did find several places that do sell it um, in catalogs. Um, I haven't seen it around here anywhere for the jostaberry. The elderberry, most people when they grow an elderberry grow it for the tree and the pretty <coughs> spring flowers. But the berries are also good. Um, it also can benefit from a cross-pollination. Um, and you can make wine out of it. <laughs> um, the goji berry, um, that has a trumpet shaped purple flower. And then it has bright red edible berries. A lot of People were into the goji berry for the antioxidants that it provides. It is not a nice tasting thing. <laughs> um, but it does fruit all summer. Um, it's self-pollinating, you only need one. Um, it is really drought tolerance once it's established. Um, we grew one of these over in Sheridan where I work. and at the greenhouse and they had to take it out because it was massive. It was huge. They couldn't control it. So if you have a place that's, it reminds me, and now I can't think of it because I'm nervous. I can't think of that vine that grows all over everybody has. Woodbine. Woodbine, yeah. It reminds me of that. So, I mean, it, it is, was massive. Um, grapes, I'm not going to go much into grapes because that could take my, all my 15 minutes, <laughs> you know. But there are a lot of zone three ones. Um, there are some zone four. The one that I have grown is the Valiant, and it grows really well for me. Sandra, what's yours? I know they have a lot at the um, Camplex um, grapes there, and I think you can go glean those. They're a little overgrown right now, so I don't know how well they're producing. I also called Susie and she said they had, um, they had some, what'd she say, um, currants and they, she had one more thing she thought was there um, that you can go glean, but I don't know. She said, I don't even know where it is, so it might not be doing so well. <laughs> um, honeyberry is one 
that is a zone two. I hadn't heard about it for a couple years. I was real excited about it. It needs two different honeyberries, two different strains to grow. I have two, they're about from here to there apart, and I haven't got it to fruit yet. So I've been doing all this research on what my problem is. It's a zone two, why wouldn't it? Well, come to find out when Scott Scoble, whatever his name is, Scoberbo was here, being a zone two, it's used to a colder climate. When it gets warm, that's when it leaves out. All, you know, mine would flower every year, but I never got any fruit. It still flowers. Either it's too cold for the pollinators here yet, or um, it gets frosted. So this year I'm covering it with a garbage can and I'm self-pollinating. Ask me next year if I got any fruit. <laughs> but it's a cross between a blueberry and a raspberry. And there was a lady at the farmer's market in Sheridan that had a big bowl of them. And I want to know how she did it. I even called the extension, or the um, Edwards. Jeff. Jeff Edwards down at the university. <clears throat> And he sent me to somebody else, and um, he hadn't got any to produce either. I mean, they are bushes. I mean, the bushes are still surviving. One is this tall, and the other one's shorter because that's what it's supposed to be. Um, but he hasn't got his to do, and he thinks it's the frost gets them. So, what bear, what's it called? Honeyberry. Honey. Yeah. And it does really well in our pH soils. I mean, the, the bush grows nice. It's not a beautiful bush because the leaves are kind of small. You know, when I think of an ornamental bush like an elderberry would be, this isn't. Um, I wanted to grow it for the fruit. Then there's huckleberry. I garden at the community garden and a couple years ago I grew huckleberries. It's an annual, what I got. The perennial is very hard to get to grow. It's, it grows wild up in Montana, but nobody's been able to get it to grow here. I grew two kinds of huckleberries, a garden huckleberry, and then the other one I can't, it begins it's like chickalita or something. And the honeyberries that I got, the bushes were like this. It was like a hedge. It was beautiful. And the honeyberries were really big. I have a picture. <laughs> yeah, huckleberries. And it's an annual. Um, it didn't taste very good. The, the chickalita ones were really small. And they tasted really good off the thing. You have to wait till they're fully ripe. But once I made syrup out of the, um, the bigger huckleberries, it was wonderful. So it's, I think it's kind of like a choke cherry. You got to make something out of it, um, which I don't mind. I like doing that. That's one of my things. Then there's the cane berries, which includes raspberries, um, blackberries. There is a blackberry um, that um, I saw that is zone three. Um, I wrote down the name of it. Baby Cakes Blackberry is one that's a zone three. They're selling it over in Sheridan. It has no thorns. I thought, mm, I'm going to try that one. A um, little bit about cane berries. Um, there's two different kinds. You have Floricane and Primocane. Primocane, and you can have raspberries in either kind. So if it's a primocane, it comes up, it grows, and it fruits on that same year. Floricane, it grows, and then the next year that cane will produce fruit. So I am going to grow primocane because then I can cut it all down. I don't have to figure out what year is what. It isn't that hard. You can tell by the stem because once it's a year old, it's much harder. The new ones are more supple. Um, but they also had a thornless one. So a thornless primal cane red raspberry. That's what I'm growing this year. I'm, I don't like thorns, you know. I don't grow very many rose bushes either. I like the roses, but I don't, the, the rose bushes I have, they've taken over because I don't trim them back like I should. Don't like to get in there. Um, then there's black raspberries, purple raspberries, thimbleberries. All kinds of berries, and everything I saw had a zone four of all those kinds. Um, one more thing about um, the canes is that everywhere I looked, trellising was recommended. Not many people do I see that trellis their raspberries, but it keeps them up off the ground. 
It's easier to trim them out. Um, and then the air can circulate through them. It's easier to pick the berries, too. You don't have to get down on your knees. And the last one that I need to talk about is strawberries. And that's another berry most people like to grow. There's three different kinds. There's a June bearing, which is very good if you're a canner because it bears in June, big crop, and then it's mostly done for the year. Then there's day neutral ones, which I cannot find. It's, they call the day neutral ones, they call them the ever bearing. So it's hard to know which is a true um, day neutral strawberry. And then there's the ever bearing ones, and they produce strawberries. They don't, they'll do kind of a bigger crop in June, July. Then they kind of have one here and there, and then they'll do maybe do one if we have a nice fall. Maybe they don't get to. It's up to Mother Nature. Um, the most popular one that I know that people grow, and it's an ever bearing, is the Fort Laramie, and it does really well here. So that's one kind I know I can recommend. And that's it. Do you like those pictures? <laughs> <laughs> I do have a handout that I um, got off the internet. It's from the University of Wyoming. And well, um, you can pick one up on the way out so you don't have to wait to have it handed to you. But it talks a little about, about raising small fruits in Wyoming. And it kind of highlights some of the ones I went over and one I didn't because I don't know anything about Saskatchewan berries. So, but it's, you need your magnifiers to read it, too. <laughs> yes? Can you send your PowerPoint to the you can keep it. Yeah, you can keep it. You got it. I got so it. So if you want to see the pictures of it, it's labeled what the name is, and then there's pictures of the berry and the plant. Um, they're really, really some very pretty plants. I'm kind of into... Um, edible landscaping. So if I can grow a bush that's just a bush, or if I can grow a bush that also produces a crop, I'm more likely to do that. I like that idea. So if you wanted to see what the bushes look like. Yes, Kim? Has cap? Have you ever grown has cap? I have not. Uh, it comes out of Minnesota. It grows really good up in Canada. Has cap? H-A-S-K-A-P. Um, it's like a long it's it's honeyberry. Honey, yeah, that is honeyberry. That's the the name for honeyberry. Okay, the and you've got that. I do have that. And it grows. Mm -hmm, it grows, but I had that's the one I haven't got to. It frosts off. I haven't got it to produce the. Yeah, it's kind of a long looking blueberry. Yeah, yeah, I have that. Four years. But somebody in Sheridan did. I don't know. And he also suggested maybe I move my plants from the south side to the north side of my yard so it doesn't warm up as quickly. And that might help me. And I'm going to try to do that. They say they are, but yeah, they can take full sun, obviously, because that's where I've had them growing. But they warm up sooner in the spring and maybe too soon. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you, Heather. Uh huh.